Book 21, The Odyssey, The Trial of Axes, during which Odysseus reveals himself to Eumaeus and Philiotis, Athena, now put it in Penelope's mind to make the suitors try their skill with the bow and with the iron axes in contest among themselves as a means of bringing about their destruction. She went upstairs and got the storeroom key, which was made of bronze, had a handle of ivory. She then went with her maidens into the storeroom at the end of the house, where the husband's treasures of gold, bronze, and wrought iron were kept, and where was also his bow, and the quiver full of deadly arrows that had been given him by a friend whom he had met in Sparta, Ephetius, the son of Eurytus. The two fell in with one another in Messene at the house of Ortrilichus, where Odysseus was staying in order to recover a debt that was owing from the whole people, for the Messenians had carried off three hundred sheep from Ithaca and sailed away of them and their shepherds. In quest of these, Odysseus took a long journey while still quite young, for his father and other chieftains sent him on a mission to recover them. If Atias had gone there also to try and get back twelve rude mares that he had lost in the mule falls that were running with them, these mares were the death of him in the end, for when he went to the house of Zeus, son, mighty Hercules, who performs such prodigies of valor, Hercules, to his shame, killed him, though he was his guest, for he feared not heaven's vengeance, nor yet respected his own table, which he had set before Ephetius, but killed him in spite of everything and kept the mares himself. It was when planning these that Ephetius met Odysseus and gave him the bow which mighty Eurytus had been used to carry, and which on his death. I had been left him to his son. Odysseus gave him in return a sword and a spear. This was the beginning of a fast friendship. Although they never visited at one of his houses, for Zeus's son Hercules killed Iphitheus ere they could do so. This bow then given him by Iphitheus had not been taken with him by Odysseus, for when he sailed for Troy, he had used it so long as he had been at home, but had left it behind as having been a keepsake from a valued friend. Penelope presently reached the oak threshold of the sword room. The carpenter had planned his dolly and had drawn a line on it so as to get it quite straight. He had then set the doorpost into it and holding the doors. She loosed the strap from the handle of the door, put in the key, and drove it straight home to shoot back to the bullets that held the doors. These flew open like a noise, like a ball bellowing in a meadow, and Penelope stepped upon the raised platform where the chest stood in which the fair linen and clothes were laid by along the fragrant herbs. Reaching thence, she took down the bow with its bow case from the peg on which it hung. She sat down with it on her knees, weeping bitterly as she took the bow out of its case. When her tears had relieved her, she went to the cloister where the suitors were, carrying the bow in the quiver with the many deadly arrows that were inside it. Along with her came her maidens, bearing a chest that contained much iron and bronze, which her husband had won as prizes. When she reached the suitors, she stood by one of the bearing posts, supporting the roof of the cloister, holding a vial before her face and with a maid on either side of her. Then she said, Listen to me, you sweet you persist in abusing the hospitality of this house because its odor has been long absent and without other pretext than that you may want to marry me. This then being the prize that you are contending for, I will bring out the mighty bow of Odysseus, and whomsoever you shall string it most easily and send his arrow through each of the twelve axes with him, I follow and quit the house of my lawful husband, so goodly and so abounding in wealth. But even so, I doubt not that I shall remember it in my dreams. As she spoke, she told Eumaeus to set the bow and the pieces of iron before the suitors, and Eumaeus wept as he took them to do so, as she had bidden him. Hard by the stockman wept also when he saw his master's bow, but Antinous sold them. You count your lots, and said he, silly simpletons. Why should you add to the sorrows of your mistress by crying in this way? She has enough to grieve her in the loss of her husband. Sit still, therefore, and eat your dinners in silence, or go outside if you want to cry, and leave the bow behind you. We suitors shall have to contend for it with might and main, for we shall find in no light matter to string such a bow as this is. There is not a man of us all who is such another as Odysseus, for I have seen him and remember him, though I was then only a child. This was what he said, but all the time he was expecting to be able to string the bow and shoot through the iron, whereas in fact he was able to first that should taste of the arrow from the hands of Odysseus, whom he was dishonoring in his own house, aiding the others on to do so also. Then Telemachus spoke, Great heavens, he exclaimed, Zeus must have robbed me of my senses. Here is my dear and excellent mother saying she will quit this house and marry again, and I am laughing and enjoying myself as though there were nothing happening. But Sufius says this contest has been agreed upon. Let it go forward. It is for a woman whose peer is not to be found in Pylos, Argos, or Mycenae, nor yet in Ithaca, nor on the mainland. You know this as well as I do. What need have I to speak in praise of my mother? Come on, then, make no excuses for delay, but let us see whether you can string the bow or no. I, too, will make trial of it, for if I can string it and shoot through the iron, I shall not suffer my mother to quit this house of a stranger, not if I can win the prizes which my father won before me. As he spoke, he sprang from his seat, threw his crimson cloak from him, and took his sword from his shoulder. First, he set the axes in a row in a long groove which he had dug for them, and he had made straight by line. Then he stand to the earth to tight round them, and everyone was surprised when they saw him set them up so orderly, though he had never seen anything of the kind before. This done, he went onto the pavement to make trial of the bow. Thrice did he tug at it, trying of all his might to draw the string, and thrice he had to leave off. Though he had hoped to string the bow and shoot through the iron, he was trying for the fourth time, and he would string it not, for Odysseus made a sign to check him in spite of all his eagerness. So he said, Alas, I shall either be always feeble and of no prowess, or I am too young and have not yet reached my full strength, so to be able to hold. My own, if anyone attacks me, you others, therefore, who are stronger than I, make trial of the bow and get this contest settled. On this he put down the bow, letting it lean against the door that led into the house, with the arrow standing against the top of the bow. Then he sat down on the seat from which he had risen, and Antinous said, Come on, each of you, in his turn, going towards the right from the place at which the cup arrow begins, when he's handing round the wine. The rest agreed, and Leonas, the son of Oneps, was the first to rise. He was sacrificial priest of the suitors, and sat in the corner, near the mixing bowl. He was the only man who hated their evil deeds, and was indignant with the others. He was now the first to take the bow and arrow, so he went on to the pavement to make his trial, but he could not string the bow, for his hands were weak and unused to hard work. They therefore soon retired, and he said to the suitors, My friends, I cannot string it. Let another have it, this bow shall take the life and soul out of many a chief among us. For it is better to die than to live after having this surprise that we have so long striven for, and which has brought us so long together. Some one of us is even now hoping and praying that he may marry Penelope, but when he has seen the bow and tried it, let him woo and make bridal offerings to some other woman, and let Penelope marry whoever makes her the best offer and whose lot it is to win her. On this he put the bow down, letting it lean against the door, with arrows standing against the tip of the bow. Then he took his seat again from the seat from which he had risen, and Antinous rebuked him, saying, Leodius,
place. Then he said to Melanthius, the goatherd, Look sharp, find a fire, then light a fire in the court, and set a seat hard by with a sheepskin on it. Bring us also a large ball of lard from what they have in the house. Let us warm the bow and grease it. We will then make trial of it again, and bring the contest to an end. Melanthius lit the fire, and set a seat covered with sheepskins besides it. He also brought a great ball of lard from what they had in the house, and the suitors warmed the bow, and made it again trial of it. But they were... None of them nearly strong enough to string it. Nevertheless, there still remained Antinous and Eurymachus, who were the ringleaders among the suitors, much the foremost among them all. Then the swine herd and the stockman left the cloisters together, and Odysseus followed them. When they had got outside the gates and outer yard, Odysseus said to them quietly, Stockman and you swine herd, I have something in my mind which I am in doubt whether to say or no, but I think I will say it. What manner of men would you be to stand by Odysseus if some god should bring him back here all of a sudden? Say which you are disposed to do, decide with the suitors or with Odysseus. Father Zeus answered the stockman, would indeed it that you might so ordain it. If some god were but to bring Odysseus back, you should see with the might and main, I would fight for him. In like words, Eumaeus prayed to the gods that Odysseus might return. When therefore he saw who was certain what mind they were of, Odysseus said, It is I, Odysseus, who am here. I have suffered much, but at last in the twentieth year I am come back to my own country. I find that you two alone, my servants, are glad that I should do so, for I have not heard of any others praying for my return. To you two, therefore, will I unfold the truth as it shall be. If heaven shall deliver the suitors into my hands, I will find wives for both of you. will give you house and holding close to my own, and you shall be to me as though you were brothers, friends of Telemachus. I will now give you convincing proofs that you may know me and be assured. See, here is the scar from a boar's tooth that ripped me when I was out hunting on Mount Parnassus with the sons of Autolycus. As smoke he drew his rags aside from the great scar when they had examined it thoroughly, they both of them wept about Odysseus, threw their arms around him and kissed his head and shoulders, while Odysseus kissed their hands and faces in return. The sun would have gone down upon the morning, and Odysseus had not checked them and said, Cease your weeping, lest someone should come outside and see us, and tell those who are within. When you go and do so separately, not both together, I will go first, and do you follow afterwards. But let this, moreover, be the token between us, as suitors will all of them try to prevent me from... Getting a hold of the bow and quiver. Do you, therefore, you us, place it in my hands when you are carrying it about, and tell the women to close the doors of their apartments. If they hear any groaning or uproar as of men fighting about the house, they must not come out. They must keep quiet and stay where they are at their work. And I charge you, Philiotius, to make fast the doors of the outer court and to bind them securely at once. When he had thus spoken, he went back to the house and took the seats that he had left. Presently, his two servants followed him inside. At this moment, the bow was in the hands of Eurymachus, who was warming it by the fire. But even so, he could not string it, and he was greatly grieved. And he heaved a deep sigh and said, I grieve for myself and for us all. I grieve that I shall have to forego the marriage, but I do not care nearly so much about this, where there are plenty of other women in Ithaca and elsewhere. What well, I feel most is the fact of our being so inferior to Odysseus in strength that we do not string his bow. This will disgrace us in the eyes of those who are yet unborn. This shall not be so, Eurymachus, said Antinous, and you know it yourself. Today is the feast of Apollo throughout all the land. Who can string a bow on such a day as this? Put it on one side, as for the axes. They can stay where they are, for no one is likely to come to the house and take them away. Let the cupbearer go round with his cups, that we may make our drink offerings and drop this matter of the bow. We will tell Melanthius to bring us in some boots tomorrow, the best he has. We can then offer thigh bones to Apollo, the mighty archer, and again make trial of the bow. So as to bring the contest to an end, the rest approved his words and thereon men servants poured water over the hands of the guests, while pages filled the mixing bowls with wine and water and handed it round after giving every man his drink offering. But then when they had made their offerings and had drunk each as much as he desired, Odysseus craftily said, Suitors of the illustrious queen, listen that I may speak even as I am minded. I appeal more especially to Eurybacchus and to Antinous, who had just spoken of so much reason. Cease shooting for the presence and leave the matter to the gods, but in the morning let heaven give victory to whom it will. For the moment, however, give me the bow that I may prove the power of my hands among you all, and see whether I still have as much. Strength as I used to have, or whether travel and neglect have made an end of it. This made them all very angry, for they feared he might string the bow. Antinous therefore rebuked him, saying, Wretched creature, you have not so much as a grain of sense in your whole body. You ought to think yourself lucky in being allowed to dine unharmed among your betters, without having any smaller portion served you than we others have had, and in being allowed to hear our conversation. No other beggar or stranger has been allowed to hear what we say among ourselves. The wine must have been doing you a mischief, as it does with all those who drink immoderately. It was the wine that inflamed the centaur Eurytion when he was staying with Pyrrhos among the Lapithae. When the wine had got into his head, he went mad and did ill deeds about the house of Pyrrhos. This angered the heroes who were there assembled. So they rushed at him and caught off his ears and nostrils, then they dragged him through the doorway out of the house, and so he went away crazed, and bore the burden of his crime, bereft of understanding. Henceforth, therefore, there was a war between mankind and the centaurs, but he brought it upon himself for his own wreckedness. In like manner, I can tell you that it will go hardly with you if you string the bow. You will find no mercy from anyone here, for we shall at once ship you off to King Echetus, who kills everyone that comes near him. You will never get away alive, so drink and keep quiet without kissing into a quarrel with men younger than yourself. Penelope then spoke to him. Antinous said he, It is not right that you should ill-treat any guest of Telemachus, who comes to this house if the stranger should prove strong enough to string the mighty bow of Odysseus. Can you suppose that he would take me home with him and make him my wife? Even the man himself can have no such idea in his mind. None of you need to let that disturb his feasting. It would be out of all reason. Queen Penelope answered Eurymachus, we do not suppose that this man will take you away with him. It is impossible, but we are afraid lest some of the baser sort, man or woman among the Urkins, should go gossiping about and say these suitors are feeble folk. They are paying court to the wife of a brave man whose bow not one of them was able to string, yet a beggarly tramp who came to the house strung it at once and sent an arrow through the iron. This is what will be said, and it will be a scandal against us. Eurymachus Penelope answered people who persist in eating up the estates of a great chieftain and dishonoring his house must not expect others to think well of them. Why then should you mind if men talk as you think they will? This stranger is strong and well built. He says more 
over that he is of noble birth, give him the bow and let us see whether he can string it or no. I say, and shall surely be that if Apollo now to him the glory of stringing it, I will give him a cloak and a shirt of goodwear with uh, sandals, they'll see him sent safely wherever he wants to go. And then Telemachus said, Mother, I am the only man either in Ithaca or in the islands that are over against Elias, who has the right to let anyone have the bow or to refuse it. No one shall force me one way or the other, not even though I choose to make the stranger a present of a bow outright, and let him take it away with him. Go then within the house and busy yourself with your daily duties, your loom, your distaff, and the ordering of their servants. This bow is a man's matter and mine above all others, for it is I who am master here. She went wandering back into the house and laid her son saying in her heart, then going upstairs with her handmaids into her room, she mourned her dear husband still, Athena, sent sweet sleep over her eyelids. The swine heard now took up the bow and was for taking it to Odysseus, but the suitors clamored at him for all parts of the cloisters, and one of them said, You idiot, where are you taking the bow to? Are you out of your wits if Apollo and other gods will grant our prayer? Your own boarhounds shall get you into some quiet little place and worry you to death. Eumias was frightened at the outcry they all raised, so he put the bow down then there. But Telemachus shouted out at him from the other side of the cloisters and threatened him, saying, Father, Eumias, bring the bow on in spite of them, for young as I am, I will pelt you with stones back to the country, for I am the better man of the two. I wish I was as much stronger than all other suitors in the house as I am than you. I would soon send some of them off sick and sorry for they mean mischief. Thus did he speak, and they all of them laughed heartily, which put them in the better humor with Telemachus. So Eumias brought the bow on and placed in the hands of Odysseus. When he had done this, he called Eurycle apart and said to her, Eurycle, Telemachus says you are too close to the doors of the women's apartments. If they hear any groaning or uproar as of men fighting about the house, they are not to come out, but are to keep quiet and stay where they are at their work. Eurycle did as she was told and closed the doors of the women's apartments. Meanwhile, Philiotus slipped quietly out and made fast the gates of the outer court. There was a ship's cable of bipolis fiber lying in the gatehouse, and so he made the gates fast with it. Then he came in again, resuming the seat that he had left, keeping an eye on Odysseus, who had now got the bow in his hands and was turning it every way about, improving it all over to see whether the worms had been eating to two horns during his absence. Then would one turn towards his neighbor, saying, This is some tricky old bow fancier. Either he has got one like it at home, or he wants to make one in such worm workman like a style, does the old vagabond handle it. Another said, I hope he may be no more successful in other things than he is likely to be in stringing the bow. But Odysseus, when he had taken it up and examined it all over, strung it as easily as a skilled bard, strings a new peg of his leer, and makes something twist gun fast at both ends. Then he took it in his right hand to prove the string, and it sang sweetly under his touch like the twittering of a swallow. The suitors were dismayed and turned color as they heard it at that moment. Moreover, Zeus thundered loudly as a sigh in the heart of Odysseus rejoiced as he heard the omen of the son of the scheming Saturn he had sent him. He took an arrow that was lying upon the table, for those which the Ucians were so shortly about to taste were all inside the quiver. He laid it on the centerpiece of the bow and drew the notch of the arrow and string towards him, still seated on his seat when he had taken aim and applied an arrow pierced every one of the handle holes of the axes from the first onwards till it had gone through them into the outer courtyard, and then he said to Telemachus, your guess has not disgraced you, Telemachus. I did not miss what I aimed at, and I was not long in stringing my bow. I am still strong, and not as the suitors twit me with being. Now, however, it is time for the Ucians to prepare supper while there is still daylight, and then otherwise to sport themselves with song and dance, which are the crowning ornaments of a banquet. As he spoke, he made a sign with his eyebrows, and Telemachus girded on his sword, grasped his spear, and stood armed beside his father's seat.